Welcome to Wealthy Living Conversations. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It's here that I have conversations with a variety of inspiring and insightful people. And we have conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. So my guest today is a podiatrist. Andy has worked as a podiatrist for 20 years, but in the past few years has seen big changes in his methods of practice. He works in alternative ways to most traditional podiatrists, becoming a disruptor in his industry. Andy has, has a committed approach to natural foot function, returning feet to the way they're designed to move in harmony with the rest of the body. He is passionate about barefoot about the barefoot movement and natural footwear. So welcome, Andy. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Our oh, pleasure. So you, along with many of the listeners, may not know that I've a background in human movement and health promotion, where many, for many years I prescribed functional fitness programs in both corporate setting and for new mums. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with you about functional foot health today. And I have loads of questions and things to cover. It's, um, it's really, in researching a lot of what you do, it's really enlightened me to see, I suppose, the foot in, um, in a whole new way and how it really is. I mean, we all know it's a part of the body, but maybe in ways that we don't necessarily um, or haven't really thought about and a lot of people haven't thought about. So, yeah, um, maybe we could start by just you telling us a little bit about your story um about how and how you shifted from a more traditional perspective on foot health so what you studied and practiced for years to what you're doing more now like in a more progressive way of thinking and working with clients yeah so i um, studied podiatry because i was interested in health science i think um, when i finished school and um, i was a runner and running at an elite level but injury plagued um, like a lot of runners and then um I got into podiatry and studied it and it was all normal. But at the time, and we'll come back to this a bit later, I was thinking I didn't really want to uh, treat people. I thought I wanted to um, maybe stay at uni and teach the students. Like I felt an, uh, maybe a passion or just an inkling that I wanted to um, become a teacher of some sort. Anyway, then I got into private practice as of my first job and I enjoyed it. And so, and off it went, you know, I was in private practice in a partnership from almost from the start for 18 years. And then um, at, at times, not always loving my job, but maybe uh, with three or four years to go in that private practice, I had a, um, a series of cycling accidents and actually had a head injury. So, so I, mean, I, couldn't, I couldn't cycle anymore. And so for some reason, I don't even know why I went into a yoga class. I'm just locally, I, I have no idea what led me to that yoga class and um, just really fell in love with the practice of yoga and noticed my feet getting stronger. And around the same time, I started going to the gym for the first time in my life and there were people training barefoot there. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because it was against everything we do um, in podiatry really to take your shoes off. Um, and so that yoga practice and training barefoot in the gym helped me get stronger feet myself. And I thought, why can't I be doing this for other people? And, and it just felt, like I'd found the thing that um, I was meant to do as a podiatrist rather than the thing I was always not 100% sure of with traditional podiatry. Traditional podiatry being really looking into orthotics or changing function with some sort of um, orthotic or footwear. And um, this way of practicing is more aligned with um, allowing your foot to function naturally and uh, getting, if, it, if it's struggling to do that, getting stronger or, mo or more mobile to help it happen. Yeah. yeah. So very briefly what's happened, but yeah. um, yeah, that's what's happened. Yeah. So the universe knew exactly where your interest levels were and where your passion was. And it yeah. did you bid you into that. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I'm quite an obsessive type of personality. And so to go from like cycling to yoga is quite a step. Yeah. And, um, and like I said, I have no idea why, but yeah, maybe the universe had, well, something led me there to that class, which has pretty much changed my life. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So where do you think um, or where do you believe that conventional podiatry needs to change? Where does it need to change now? Yeah. 
Um, so I think it's already changing to some extent. I, I know they teach more strength and conditioning and mobility and um, than they used to, but there's still a heavy reliance upon modern shoes and orthotic prescription, less orthotic prescription than there used to be, but definitely they don't see the shoe. So where it needs to change, to answer your question, where, where it needs to change is to see the shoe as a negotiable. Like they negotiate between like this style of shoe and that style of shoe, but not to say that you could go without shoes. And so that's the big step because that changes everything. When we take away the modern shoe, uh, we, allow the foot to function naturally and that makes a huge difference so that's the the big um the big step that needs to change that needs to happen yeah mm. we need to make shoes modern shoes a questionable item <laughs> rather than going like most podiatrists will see someone and don't even question the shoe that they're wearing it's interesting isn't it um i definitely want to talk a whole lot about um about footwear and about orthotics later in the conversation. I definitely yeah. want to go there because I think that's an area where I think for me personally, when I think of podiatry, I definitely think of orthotics. So I really want to talk about that. But before we do, like if, if this is right, what you're saying, and we need to look at um, not just what type, what, what type of footwear, but the fact of possibly not wearing footwear, what what physiological principles are there to support this view? So you might, like, I would like to flip the question and say, what are the physiological principles that suggest that we need to have support, cushioning, um, control, uh, the, a different shape on our foot? Like, there is, um, there is, there's no grounds for supporting any part of our body if we've developed and been designed this way over thousands of years to suddenly need to support our foot. And so um, I think the question can definitely be flipped around to find out, to, to ask why we need that support, but I'll answer it anyway. <laughs> um, so there's something called the set principle, principle, the specific adaptation to implied, imposed demand. And so our body reacts to that. So when we apply a, um, a stress, our body reacts by, um, maybe taking a step back or absorbing that stress, recovering, and then get stronger, okay? And so our foot, if it was never ever put into a supportive shoe, would do that as we naturally developed. And uh, as soon as we put a supportive shoe or shoes with a heel or cushioning on it, then our body doesn't have to um, have that demand placed upon it. And so it switches off to some extent. It doesn't um, adapt to its environment. And so we become more and more used to that um, that, uh, you know, the shoe that, that we put on. And so then it becomes something that we need because we've become so used to it. And so my argument is that we should never need it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like a neck brace, we wouldn't, if we had a sore neck, we wouldn't, um, we might use a neck brace for a short period of time, but if we left it on forever, we wouldn't um, have a very strong neck. And similarly, if we wear a shoe that's supportive, controlling, cushioned, our feet are going to slowly but surely um, not be as strong as they should be, mm. as they're designed to be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it definitely makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. yeah, it definitely makes sense. So if these physiological principles support your view, why do you think more foot health practitioners aren't seeing, supporting and practising this approach? I think because it's what podiatrists have always done, you know, it's, the old, oh, that's what we do, you know. When we see something that's uh, injured or overused, we support it and take the pressure off it, which is um, understandable. I, I use the same principles, but I do it in a more natural way. I'll work on mobility and strength of the surrounding structures to take the pressure off rather than using an orthotic and a big shoe. Mm. And so um, I think in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a running boom. This is um, something that I've sort of been delving into lately. And so a lot, of, um, a lot of sedentary people became runners and uh, the running shoe of the time was a bit like a Dunlop volley a, 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 or a plimsoll, a thin, flexible-soled shoe. And it, it requires that you run correctly and that running is a skill that most of us, are, um, you know, develop into as four- and five-year-olds. But when we start putting heel cushion shoes on, we lose that ability to run. So yes, back to the 60s, 70s, a lot of um, 
people that weren't runners started running because of this running boom and the big shoe companies of the time started putting heels and cushions into runners to allow them uh, to allow the runner in, into shoes to allow the runner to um, be able to get away with this poor technique and then it just became the normal to do that to the point now that if you go to you know the local park everyone is in that shoe a heel cushion shoe um, whether they ever had an injury or not if you go to the local kindergarten there are four and five year olds in that heeled and cushioned shoe and and that was a um a new phenomenon to have an athletic shoe that was like that uh that was you know only 50 60 years ago that 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 sort of came into being athletic shoes before that were a shoe that let your foot function yeah a shoe that let your foot function like a foot that allowed your foot to move naturally mm. and so podiatry has been around for a long time but like longer than 60 or 70 years, but the boom in, in its biomechanical principles came around that time. And so I think podiatry's um, answers or the way we work as podiatrists generally has been about what that shoe does to the foot. And it, I think it magnifies all the things that go, go on in the foot that aren't great. And so um, podiatry is about um, controlling that even more, like putting an orthotic in or, or doing things that um, control the foot to the nth degree rather than just letting the foot be a foot. Mm. So th that's what traditional podiatry still does and it's hard to change. Like the universities are very slow in changing. They still teach things that they taught me 20 years ago. Mm. Um, they're coming on board with strength and conditioning, uh, but it's still a bit part to the big picture of, um, of what podiatrists traditionally do. And there's huge industry involved in what podiatrists traditionally do do, whether that be orthotic labs, the podiatrists themselves prescribing orthotics are very, um, it's a very uh, financially rewarding thing to do. Um, the private health insurers often give their clients a, a new pair of orthotics every year. Like this is, uh, it's, it's almost scandalous that that's the case. Um, if we need an orthotic, and we'll talk about it more later, it shouldn't be for a long, long term. It shouldn't be that you need to replace it every year. So, um, yeah, there's a whole industry about it. And so changing it is, is a big deal. Yeah, and I'm sure that unlearning things, I mean, we all, whether it be about something that we've studied for our professional career or just something that we've been taught by our parents, beliefs and um, knowledge that we yeah. think that we have at any point in time is something that's, you know, really hard. I mean, unlearning is just hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, to go against everything you've ever known. And my st I still in practice, I see that foot that I used to put an orthotic under and it's like my gut feel to do that, to support it. Yeah. You know, or um, I saw a guy last week who has um, seven pairs of orthotics from seven different podiatrists over four years. Like they keep making the same, there's not a go-to, there's not a, another answer. You know, it's like, oh, this one will work, this one will work. They all look pretty much the same. You know, so um, that's pretty detrimental to the profession that that's going on, I think. Yeah, it is. So when you, I mean, I really, I think a lot of people are going to be really interested in, you know, in a minute when I talk more about, you know, the common foot problems and go back yeah. to really looking at footwear and orthotics. But there's a few things that um, I think I generally have a audience, which are people that are entrepreneurs and look to think outside the box. So that's something you've done. So I want to just explore that for a little bit further and then get on to some of those more specific things with the foot. But you know, like, I want to hear, like, when you, I mean, what you're just saying, um, you know, to a general listener sounds really reasonable, sounds practical, sounds common sense. But yet, and you've had 20 years as a podiatrist, so I'm assuming you've got quite a big network of um, professional colleagues. And so what is the main resistance in arguments that you come up against when you share just this stuff with them? I mean, they're, they're not going to say, oh, well, I'm doing it for the money. They're not, they might be doing it for the money, but, <laughs> but they're, oh, most people aren't going to actually admit that. So what's the main argument that you come up against? Just on that, I, I spoke to a podiatrist who, and we're just chatting, and I said I'd only prescribe two orthotics in a year. And she said to her, her, um, her employee, we can't have that. <laughs> You know, like, um, okay. so, there, and that was a very open <laughs> discussion. But um, the I don't have a lot to do with other podiatrists and they would usually think of me as um, a nuisance maybe or like he can just do that, that's fine because um, it's not 
making a big enough wave. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. I'm not harming what they're doing. And maybe I'm seeing the people that they're really struggling with, the people that have had seven pairs of orthotics in four years, and they're happy for me to, say, <laughs> to see them because they're the ones that they can't help. Um, I've got close friends that are podiatrists and they, and they don't ignore it. They sometimes ask me for advice about what I would do about a certain situation because maybe I've got a different go-to for certain problems. Um, like I, don't, I, I do feel a bit like a black sheep, but I don't really have a lot to do with other podiatrists. So I'm just kind of doing my own thing. And the ones that I do have something to do with are the ones that are on board with this and are really interested in it. Otherwise, you know, people, other podiatrists might follow me on Instagram and things like that. And so I know they're seeing it, but they're just not saying anything. Or if they do, they're very, um, uh, they're very um, tactical about it. They try not to, you know, um, ruffle too many feathers. We're all just getting along, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair enough. So there's a lot of, you know, just let's not call the elephant out in the room sort of stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you know you're someone therefore that's gone against the status quo, obviously your life events and life circumstance, like you discussed before, have led you in that pathway. What advice could you give to other practitioners that maybe in their industries are seeing things in a different way from either their lived experience, you know, generally from their lived experience, whether it be a professional experience with clients or something that's happened to them personally and they're experienced on a personal level. And they want to jump out of the traditional model and go against, you know, the resistance. Um, what would you suggest to them? Like, how did you do that? And how did you have the confidence to just get going and do it? So it was interesting because I was still working in a practice where they did traditional podiatry. And so it was very hard to change much of what I was doing, but I wasn't happy. And it wasn't because I was, I don't think, I don't think I was not happy because I was practicing differently. I just thought I was not happy because of the general situation there. And yeah. my wife, who I don't need her permission and, and nor does she need mine for her career choices either. But um, I, she said, you know, you don't always have to be there, Andy. And I'd just been um, thinking that I was going to be set up in this practice for the rest of my life. And for someone to actually say, you know what, you don't have to, then it was just like this, um, you know, it was a whole world opened up to me that there was an option to do something different. And then what you have to do, and this is what I've learned, like I, um, in a yoga class and someone, and you know, often they give you little motivational things at the start or the end, where it just dawned upon me, I just have to take these steps. When they come to me, when these doors open, you just have to step through them. And it's very daunting. Like I feel like now at the moment, I'm stepping through half a dozen doors that are opened up to me. And then I'm like, how am I going to fit all this in? But if you don't just step through, so, you know, someone else will, or you'll regret the choice mm -hmm. um, one day. Uh, you know, I'm also told that the door will open again for you later on and you'll have another opportunity. So you don't have to like, you know, squeeze it all in. But um, basically my little motto now is if when these opportunities come, just say yes and just let's see where it goes, basically. Um, it's very hard to um, make those things happen. So when they do happen, you just have to go for it, I think. And in that, in a year of practice, and it could have been the worst year of practice given what we've just been through over the last 12 months yeah. with COVID. Um, it's been amazing. It's like I've been unleashed. All these opportunities coming up. I'm loving my work. Like if it, I've, um, my biggest issue is not enough time, you know, like it's been amazing. So um, just stepping through those. And there, it was huge life change to leave a partnership of 18 years. It's like having a marriage breakdown. So, um, and still probably the hardest thing I've ever done to actually have that conversation saying I'm leaving. So, um, and I get emotional thinking about it actually. So uh, yeah, you just have to take those steps. That would be my advice. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it seems that that yoga that you fell into um, yeah. that day gave you a lot more than um, better foot, foot or body function. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. I use it every day to breathe through issues to, you know, just bring back to myself um, what I, you know, just always coming back to that sense of self that you've talked about. Yeah, brilliant. That's so, that's such good advice. And I think for a lot of people, it really does take a lot of courage and self-worth to really um, move forward. Now, yeah. just going back to, um, I suppose, what you mentioned before when I talked about, um, about, what people learn and that you know the same things are being 
are being taught in podiatry education at university um, as they were taught 20 years ago. So what assumptions do you think that we're fed um, as people, not just the um, professionals or the practitioners, but also as clients by the medical association that you believe is actually total, just actual BS and is having a negative impact on people's self-worth and on their ability to accept um, accept their body and, you know, even going and bordering on the body shaming and all of those things. Like, are we is the medical association and all of these, um, the board that's teaching all this medical um, fix-it stuff, <laughs> yeah, that technical term yeah. <laughs> is yeah. actually impacting a whole nother movement of people's self worth. Yeah, the way we talk to clients is so powerful. And to say to someone, you have rolled in feet, or you over pronate, or you've got flat feet like this, these are such negative things that people take on board and uh, label themselves as that forever. And, and and it's not relevant at all. And that's just in feet. And I'm sure it's with a whole lot of, like it's with um, Western medicine in general. Like our bodies are amazingly able to function, whether that be perfectly. Like I think we have this idea that there's this perfect anatomical function, whether that be um, postural or it could be how your kidneys work. There's all these um, ideas of perfection and that we should all be striving for it. And if we're not, there is something wrong with us. And there's not something wrong with us. It's just our body is in this constant um, state of ebb and flow and of um, repair and growth. And, it, and any assessment is a snapshot of that moment. And you can change from that time as well. So I think Western um, medicine has huge amount to... Um, uh, the O's, the O's, Western Medicine O's Society, like a big um, sorry, pretty much, to say, you know, there is, there is not fault with most of our bodies, mm. you know. And if there is fault, it's stuff that our body can usually cope with amazingly well, amazingly adaptable. And as much as you can, in the foot term realm, get adapted to wearing um, highly cushioned, supportive shoes, uh, from you know when you're four or five you can also go back the other way you know like your body can and I, and I think there's an innate uh, baseline that your body wants to go knows and can go back to and obviously some people are further away from that than others but I think it's a whole lot easier to go back than to add in yeah yeah, yeah. I mean I just know even in my personal um, experience my daughter who is 16 has done gymnastics since the time she was just before five and she's just retired now or she's just doing a very you know as in during COVID and yeah. so she's had pretty much a 10-year career in gymnastics where for anywhere between 15 and 25 hours a week she's wearing bare feet and she's you know you know using her feet for balance and all of yeah. those things. And so yeah. her body is actually, apart from, you know, being over um, overstressed a lot of the time with gymnastics, is functionally really strong. And yeah. yet she has major overpronation. And that's, I think, just more of a genetic thing than anything else. And yeah. yet the other day I said to her, you know, you're lucky you've had all this gymnastics because your feet operate really well because you've yeah. got such good balance and such good stability coming from your base. And yeah. she said to me, the first thing she ran, nah, my feet are crap. My feet are shit. Look at them. Yeah. And that and so, because of this overpronation that we've to been told is such a bad thing. Yeah. And, and I it doesn't it's a bad thing because <laughs> I've been yeah, told it, that. Yeah, um, it doesn't matter the shape of our foot, it's the way, the way it functions with the rest of our body. And so some of the most functional feet don't look great at all, but they're highly functional. And it's all about um, the load and how much load they can tolerate. And if you overload anything, even the most functional looking foot, it will get injured. And if you have a foot that is a long way from what looks ideal, maybe you'll have to go a bit slower on the loading it. But um, it's, it's nothing to do with the arch shape 
And there's really great reach research to show that. And there's nothing to do with alignment either. And orthotics and shoes don't realign your foot to make it function better. So therefore, what does what does the what does the shape of your arch matter if the alignment is not going to if changing the alignment is not going to matter either. So um, yeah, there's a lot of questions to be answered about what we've been taught. And you know, like when you're in business and someone and you think someone needs an orthotic, you'll tell them what they need to hear probably to get them into that orthotic, whether that be the truth or not. Um, or even, if, and you don't know that it's not the truth, but so I'm not blaming all the practitioners that do that, but um, it's just what happens. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, but the same, the same oh. thing, if I, if I sort of like um, do a counter argument that I'd love yeah. you to counter again, yeah. Yeah. you know, if I put logic hat on and I've got, um, obviously no one who's listening on audio can see my hand here, but say yeah. that's my foot, right? I've got my hand flat and my foot goes inward. So over pronates. If yeah. I'm doing that, and I look at my leg, I can see that my ankle has gone in, that my knee has gone inward, and therefore my hip has changed as well. I mean, it goes back to that, the knee bone is connected to the thigh bone, you know, all that song that we got taught. And I mean, in a way, that's true. So yeah. how do you say that the foot, when it's overpronated or whether it's in an orthotic and therefore in its more, um, more natural or more um, stable or aligned, yeah. aligned yeah. position isn't affecting the alignment of the body. I don't understand how that's not affecting it. Well, um, so the proof, the way an orthotic works is not by realigning. So we know that, okay? So it doesn't realign your foot. So even putting something in there to change the alignment doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't, um, ch doesn't actually change the alignment. The foot still rolls in, okay? So um, it, it works. The orthotic works because it changes load. We can also change load by strengthening some uh, part of your body or mobilizing another part of your body um, or sitting less so your hips are more functional because when your hips are more functional you're far less likely to have that rolled in foot rolled in leg tw twisted in leg and then rolled in foot i see you might see sort of chicken or egg is it the foot changing the hip or is it the hip changing the foot mm. like i think that i actually think it's the foot changing the hip i think now that it's more trunk and hips related changing what the foot is going on at the foot Mm. And so, so we see someone with very poor postural control or someone that's had multiple abdominal surgeries, whether that be a cesarean or whatever, um, or hip injuries or hip osteoarthritis or sit, sitting for eight hours a day and remembering that um, we, a sedentary person is someone that sits for six hours a day. And if you actually took a sitting diary, a lot of us are sitting for more than six hours a day. So there is an epidemic of hip dysfunction and I think that's what leads to feet that roll in more, okay? And so um, if we get the hips functional, then our feet become functional and they still will look rolled in, but they'll be far more functional, okay? Um, yeah, there are some people that have what's called, like genetically they've got a flat foot and maybe sometimes we need to support it, but it's very, very rare that we need to support it. And that's when the bones are aligned in a certain way that can't change, like they're stuck that way basically. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm hearing is you're saying that podiatrists will do the argument that if you support the foot and then you realign up to the, while you're wearing it, not for yeah. after you're wearing, but while you're wearing it, you're realigning up to the hip. Therefore, yeah. you're, you're, um, you're improving the hip position and yeah. therefore eliminate or well, reducing the risk factors of the pain or other, th other risk factors for further injury. Um, yeah. is, and what you're saying is actually looking at it the other way around and going, all right, well, what lifestyle factors are actually affecting my foot to roll in? And how, is it able to stay in that position if I, for example, lose weight and not putting the load on it as much? If I, example, don't sit as much, um, that I do certain exercises to increase the muscles, muscles in the surrounding area from the hip all the way down to the foot, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So you're looking more on a a lifestyle they're both looking at i suppose prevention in a way but you're looking at more from a lifestyle prevention point of view yeah and if i see someone like i often see say 10 year olds because their mum's worried about their feet rolling in and so we um look into the hip mobility look into their and then they don't have pain so if there's no pain i think that's a functional foot you know like they're probably functioning really well 
um, because they don't have pain. They're getting through their normal day-to-day -day life without any discomfort. They're quite a functional being. And so um, I, I'm not going to try and change the alignment of that just so that they feel comfortable that they're, they're going to have an arch while they're wearing their orthotic. That, that doesn't um, help at all. Like the proof that orthotic works is, and they do work, um, is that it changes load on structures. And so when we, we shouldn't be using an orthotic to give someone an arch because not having an arch doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more about how well the foot is controlled by, the, by all the muscles in the body and within itself as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, lots for people to think about and it obviously changes, a, you have really have to do a, mind shift, a mindset shift in order to see it differently because we've been fed by, you know, a lot of professionals, including your GPs, um, yeah. about that being overpronation being a problem and causing a lot of problems and the fact that we need to fix it, um, especially while we're doing loaded exercise. Yeah. So, and, and, yeah, go on. Just quickly, um, it's, it's, that's because... They don't know any better. That's just what they have been taught as well. Yep. Just say that in, you know, 1900, we all started wearing neck braces and then we all just thought that's what we should do. And then someone came along 120 years ago, although I'm not the first to do, the people have been saying this for a long time. I'm just saying it as a podiatrist, which is a bit um, more unusual, but there are others, came along and said, okay, now you don't have to wear your neck braces, okay? Because you're going to make your neck strong by doing this and you're going to move your neck around. And it's not dissimilar. We'd all be like, wow, that's really um, mind blowing. Like, what are you talking about? All we're suggesting is that like, let's, let's let our body function the way it's meant to, the way it was designed to for thousands and thousands of years without any, any problems. Yes. And uh, yeah, I mean, there would be problems, but without the problems we have today, yes. but it goes, it's, it's not just about not using your orthotics or those big shoes. It's about a whole lifestyle change. It's not like our kids sit in school chairs from like my daughter when she's in grade six was upset that she had to still sit on the mat because so I thought well that means from grade six they think they have to sit in the chair so for the next if they go to university as well 12 years they are sitting in chairs for most of the time and this is highly developmental time for their bodies so this is not just about changing your what you put on your feet this is about changing your whole way of life yeah so we go back to the way we're meant to move yeah. And I think that that, you know, so would you say that something like the stand desks movement that's becoming a lot bigger now is a really good thing? Definitely. Yes. But people stand at standing desks in a heeled shoe, which throws off their back as well. Um, but anyway, but yes, and moving, and moving around. So one of the big things that I prescribe for someone that has hip, like a tight hip would be to sit on the floor for half an hour a day. And I might give them some ideas of the positions to go into, but really they just need to, um, uh, they'll be uncomfortable because they're sitting on the floor. And so they're, they're, um, all different ways, whatever you feel like you cycle, I might give someone nine different positions to cycle through. And as soon as you're uncomfortable, move to the next position. Yeah. What you're basically doing then is exposing your hip to all the positions it's meant to be able to get to compared to sitting in a normal shape, you know? Yeah. So if someone does that for half an hour a day and they get up and go, wow, my, my hips feel great because they've just been like in their own personal mm -hmm. yoga class. And um, then we start making very small steps to having more functional body. Yeah, I mean, you even think of, when I think of that, I think of like going and you, to a third world country and you always see really old, quite old people um, in the field still doing some manual labor. And you think, oh yeah. my God, I'm like, you know, not even close to their age and my back hurts or things hurt, yeah. but they've been doing that sort of squashing and sit, yeah. you know, like sitting on the floor for most of their lives. They hardly ever yeah. sit in chairs and they definitely, you know, don't spend the whole day just sedentary. Yeah. And uh, another group that I see a lot of is 13, 14, 15 year old boys that are gaming a lot in their spare time and they might be, um, highly, they get called highly active because they do three different sports, which is about six hours of, of exercise a week. That's six hours of exercise a week. And boys at that age, or sorry, children at that age, should be exercising for six hours a day, pretty much. You know, they should be on the move all the time. Um, or not all the time, but a lot of the time. And so when we, I see these boys at 
especially boys, because they're the ones that are into gaming, um, they're going through this growth spur and I ask them to squat and they can't get their thighs below parallel. This is a basic fundamental human position and they're stuck on the ground. And they're stuck in their chairs because they, they come home from school and they do their hour of exercise for training, you know, and then they, and this is their high, these highly functional kids supposedly, but they can't do the most, most basic functional things because the rest of the time they're stuck in one position. And it's no bad position, it's just the position that you spend a lot of time in. Yeah, and I mean, I've got a son who's a similar age to that and I'm thinking yeah. about him when you talk and yeah, yeah he, his flexibility is really, um, you know, at the lower end and yeah. he would argue that that's just his natural body and I think that there is a part of that, like genetically, yeah. Yeah. his yes. father probably isn't very flexible but then who knows what his lifestyle was like, etc. Um, I know that I am quite flexible. So, you know, I don't know how much of it is, um, is nature and how much of it's nurture, but, um, yeah. but yeah, there would be, you do hear a lot of say boys as particularly that age, um, are a lot less flexible since say girls that age. And yet I'm yeah. not sure that girls are necessarily more active. They might be doing different activities, but I'm not sure that they're necessarily more active. So how do you, I think the flexibility part at that age is the boys are going through that growth spurt and girls as well. And so they tend to stiffen up more around that age. I'm just speaking very generally. I think what um, makes it worse is if they're not moving in a variety of ways. The other thing we see is kids that do one sport 10 hours a, and not a sport like gymnastics like your daughter, because that's so variable. And so movement variability, is, yeah, movement variability is the key to, um, to, developing a healthy, well-rounded body. Because if you're doing one sport, your body gets so used to it in its developmental phase that um, it gets very one track. That's when you're gonna see those overuse injuries and, and those issues, especially while they're growing. And so, um, you know, I, I ask kids to go and climb trees and move their bodies in ways that are, aren't uniform. Like if, you, mm -hmm. if you're a swimmer, you're doing the same thing over and over again. There's so many of our structured sports are just the same activity over and over again. And really, uh, that's, that's um, because of industrialization. So sport became something you do rather than just because of movement. You know, move, um, it's really about becoming a mover, but our society is just not set up to be movers. We're, we're set up to, be, um, to do sport in this little pocket of time and to do education in this little pocket of time and to do leisure in this pocket of time rather than just living a mobile and active life. Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, hearing you say this, I mean, there's so much truth in what you say and it's just a whole massive conversation, isn't it? It's not just, yeah. you know, looking at this particular thing. It's actually in society, what are our, um, what, what has become the status quo of what we do and, and you know, how to actually move from that and disrupt yeah. that in when you're fighting really systems to do that. So, Everything I think really, unfortunately, for real change to happen, we can do it. All we can really do is on our own individual levels and hopefully be able to influence those close to us or influence right. our clients, if, you know, which yeah. are also close to us. But in the very end, to get major societal change, it all has to be systemic change, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah there's, a move, there's the movement movement um, where, where, like you're saying, having an effect on the people around us and maybe then they go and have an effect. And, yes. I, and I see that. I see it firsthand. Like yeah. I walked with a guy. I walked with a guy three mornings a week during our, our lockdown, and he's now wearing minimalist shoes. Not because I was promoting it. I, he just saw me being a functional person. You know, he's now doing yoga three times a week. Not again because I was promoting it. Just because he saw me being more fu a more functional person. So it's just by, about leading by example. And um, as a podiatrist, like if we want to bring it back to feet, it's very hard because I'm seeing someone still in this traditional setting as a consultation. But I think I'm seeing people that are highly motivated movers and they're just having issues along the way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's not my job. I don't think it's my job, but some people would say it is, to motivate up people. But I, I don't think it is. It's got to come from within. You've got to... Um, you, you've got to have the will to do it. My job is to educate people as the why, you know, so... Um, yeah, but I think the power of, of uh, being a good example is like, amazing. And that can really, really spread. Like that guy's kids now wear minimalist shoes. 
they're more aware of their functionality, you know, like suddenly with it spreads its wings and, and, you know, maybe in six years time when my youngest is finishing high school, half of his year 12 will be wearing a, a functional shoe rather than, you know, like, and then that spread is huge. Then it becomes more normal. Yeah. yeah. Totally. I mean, look, it looks like there's a few things that come to mind when you were just talking then. Yeah. One is that, I suppose, just like in the coaching industry, which I'm in, you're acting more as a guide for self-mastery. Yeah. So you're not acting as this person who just is mechanically trying to fix the problems. Like you're not just that body mechanic. You're actually the body guide who's, you know, yeah. helping people and educating them for their self-mastery and so that you become redundant in a way and they're seeing you just for that um, that uh, ability to stay on top of things or debrief or get your advice or things like that, but not necessarily yeah. that they've got enough knowledge that they can actually start to get to know their body well and have better self-mastery. Exactly. Yeah, and, exactly. That's really good. Yeah. yeah, and there was something else that came to mind when you were speaking. There. Sorry. I've just, just forgotten, but I'm sure it'll come back. Well, but, maybe about the, the power of, was it something to do with um, being an example? Yeah. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, no, I know what it is. It's about collaboration. So I love collaboration and I think this is about out of the box thinking. So you'd never yeah. probably put something like, um, yes, you put footwear and fashion together, but you would not yeah. put it in um, necessarily functional footwear and fashion. You might, I mean, maybe slightly, but um, I think this is where real collaborations can occur that can instigate a lot of change because in the end you get a group of teenagers and all they care about really is fitting in and doing what, you know, getting that um, yeah. peer cred. You know, they need that social credibility. And so, you know, it's very rare, unless you've got a real a kid with great self-worth, um, yeah. they're going to just go and wear something that they know is good for them um, if they're going to get shit for it. Yeah. So it's about how do you, how do you work with some of the brands which really um, speak to those age groups or even speak yeah. to adults? Or how do, you, how do you work with those brands to design things that people want to wear not yeah. just for their functionality but for their look yeah that's a huge it's a huge issue and um i did a little meme where there's a big clown's foot and and when you first wear a minimalist shoe you look down and you think you've got this big clown's shoe on but then within three months you look at a point every other shoe looks like a pointy heeled heeled shoe you know like your perspective can change but um, because that is a big issue for a lot of people, the way that a minimalist or a natural footwear looks. Um, and so it does take a big change. And for children especially, it's a huge um, deal. And this is where it's even more damaging when they get told they've got a flat foot or that they need support. And then, so that, that's in one ear. And then there's this thing that doesn't even appeal to the way, that, to the way it looks um, in the other side. And so it's, it shouldn't be us against them, but often it, gets that feeling about it, you know. Um, the, some of the best experiences as a clinician are when I speak to someone, especially younger people, saying that you, that have already they've got these preconceived ideas about their feet and what they and how functional they are. And I just tell them, you know, obviously after assessing them, that they have highly functional feet. And to see them, the relief that they have to think I don't have to wear that big chunky shoe, you know, like and so that's um, for me a lot about what I do, just letting people know that their feet are very functional. Mm. If they, yeah, and, and that we can improve it still as well. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we're living really in a world where medical health technology is quickly becoming the answer to solving problems. Yeah. And so many people would argue that it's also the way to prevent problems. And something, I suppose, like the orthotic or footwear, um, like sporting footwear, is seen to be technically advanced versus, yeah. say, you know, so when you look at, like, technology versus natural living and the world is moving towards the technology approach, how do you then get your message across and not just shun technology but actually work with technology so that you can move forward in this movement and this way of thinking in a technological way as well. 
Yeah. So I, I wonder if you can, because I don't think there's anything better than a barefoot, really. Yeah. Our, bare, our feet have it all. They don't need any help. I think um, there's a famous quote by Da Vinci. He said, the foot is a masterpiece of human anatomy or something like this, the way it moves. Like, it's unbelievably, t- mm. like, it's so complex. It's not a mistake that it does this. Mm-hmm. Yet shoe companies will bring out a new shoe every six or 12 months saying that it's the latest and greatest. This is going to solve this. Like Nike recently had something um, where it said they're actually going to reduce injuries, which is nigh on impossible because nearly all injuries are due to overload. So when, you, so when someone's run too much, you know, or done too much of an activity, their system's not ready for it and that's why they get injured. And so... For them to come out and say, oh, we're, we're going to reduce injuries, um, it, it's, yeah, it's very hard to marry the two, that techno- technology and the barefoot movement, because really we're asking people to go back to their, their, their roots, the, the roots of, of the way humans were designed. Um, so what's the middle ground then? Because, I mean, really, yeah. it's great to go, you'll get people who will go to the beach and obviously go barefoot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so there's a middle ground. Yeah. Run in the beach barefoot. There's barefoot, yeah. obviously, when you're doing certain activities like yeah. yoga yeah. or you can do it yeah. when you're doing Pilates or you're going to a class where they're encouraging barefoot. But yeah. how do you, I mean, you can't go, you know, I could say going to the gym and doing your weights barefoot is going to be better for you, but safety yeah. issues go and that gym, someone drops a weight onto their foot yeah. And they're up for a whole lot of money being sued because they've allowed people yeah. to wear their foot. It's not going to happen. Um, just, yeah. And so, you know, if I if I walk down the street, like I often sometimes, well, I often sometimes, that doesn't really make sense, does it? Um, <laughs> I occasionally will jump in my car barefoot. I shouldn't say this out loud because I actually think it's probably illegal. Oh, but anyway, go on. Um, and yeah. um, drop the kids somewhere knowing that I don't have to get out of the car. Okay. But there has been times that I go, sugar, I need petrol and I might have got out of the car. And I'm sitting self-conscious because it's not socially acceptable unless yeah. you're seen as a hippie to, <laughs> to walk in the street barefoot. Yeah. So how do you actually get over that resistance? Do you just not care what people think? Or yeah. what about the fact that there is glass all over pavements now and people don't respect the streets and you can cut your foot? I mean, there's yeah. a lot of things stopping barefoot movement going forward. Yeah, it's, in, it's good that we're having these conversations because mostly I have conversations on podcasts with people that are really already barefooters and you are to some extent, but it's important that, um, I, that we get asked the questions, the harder questions. And so if we go back to the gym, like a lot of gyms do let you train barefoot. I don't know an athletic shoe that would protect you from a 20 kilo thing landing on your foot anyway. So I, I don't think that argument stands at all. Mm. And so the gyms that don't let you are often these big gyms that have a lot of causes, but the little gyms that know what they're doing, you know, in terms of function, they're fine with it. They often have a little clause saying, if you hurt yourself, it's not our fault. Fair enough. Okay. So um, the gym is a perfect place to be barefoot, I would say. Um, and that includes taking your socks off. Like I see a lot of people in the gym with their socks on and, you know, like my feet can look pretty bad. But really, um, having your socks is just another layer between you and the ground, and the feeling the ground is so important. Um, personally, I don't have a problem with going barefoot anywhere. I do get conscious, like I still get conscious of it if I go into the supermarket barefoot, because people look at me in a strange way, but I don't um, care that they look at me, and I, I love the feeling. You should try it, because the floor is really cool in there. It's really lovely. Um, <laughs> and to be to be barefoot is to be in connection with everything your environment to you know at a level that you you don't know, and it slows you down in life. In a world where we're just rushed in life, you must Very slow great. down. Yeah. And um, in all my barefooting adventures over the last few years, I have not once stood on glass that cut me cut my foot. But I, I'm sure it happens. Um, and just when I, like when I walk the dogs and I have shoes on, I'll be like, oh. Um, watch it. I feel sorry for them, but they don't cut their feet that much on glass at all, really, either. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm not biting out feet to a dog's feet, but there are similarities. <laughs> now, so, but that brings us to, really, to answer your question, there's something called natural footwear or functional footwear or minimalist footwear, and there is a huge range, and the, it's big in, um, in Eastern Europe in that kind of health farmy type of way. They've got a lot of little brands that make a lot of shoes and some really stylish shoes. Um, it goes all the way to these custom-made work shoes that you could wear with the suit and be going to get married, you know? That's at that end of the scale. And the other end of the scale is 
something called an earth runner, which I spend a lot of time in, which is just like a strip of rubber with some straps over it. And they've got a co copper plug to make sure you're earthing, which um, is a nice idea, but I don't wear it for that. I just know it's a highly functional piece of footwear. And that's what I would wear more than I even go barefoot because are they like, the to tell you the truth, the toes? Are they the ones with the toes? No, no, that's a pair of, they're Vivos. Uh, no, they're um, Vibrams, five fingers. They're, like I even I admit, they look horrible, but they, they, are, they do feel highly functional. I mean, these are just like a thong, but they've got a strap on the back. Uh -huh. um, and, and they're thin. And so even I, I know that I have to walk a lot slower if I'm barefoot. And so still most of the time, like 70% of the time, I have shoes on. And that's because I'm go, I have to go somewhere and be somewhere and I don't want to have to go slower, you know? So, yeah. Um, that, but that's a, a huge realm of functional footwear. A shoe should only protect you from sharp things, hot and cold. And so that's what a functional shoe is, something that only protects you from sharp things, hot and cold. It's wide at the toes, it's flexible, it allows your foot to function normally. It doesn't affect the way your foot functions. And that's what a functional shoe is. And that's the answer to, to all your problems. <laughs> And, and can I just do a counter arg an argument as well as yes, an argument yeah. on foot, foot, barefoot stuff or wearing yeah. these type of unsupported shoes? Going back to your initial thing that you said about, um, you know, we're born in a certain way. We're not born to have them supported. Now, yeah. that's true, but our environment, like our body hasn't evolved and our body is still the same, but yeah. our environment has. So... Yeah. We, um, we have concrete everywhere where there might not have been as much concrete. Um, there's not as much, there's tiles, there's, you know, there's a lot more, there's asphalt, there's surfaces that yeah. maybe didn't exist before when the human body, you know, came into being. And so this argument of, you know, the body's supposed to be a certain way is all yeah. great. But when our environment changes and we do sit on chairs a lot of the time, and I know that needs to happen, but as we discussed before, there's a lot of systemic yeah. change that needs to happen for that to happen. Yeah. So where we are living lifestyles that aren't necessarily supporting good foot health and our environment has surfaces that don't, aren't necessarily natural, um, yeah. how does this argument still stand? Yeah, that's a great, a very good question and a very common question. I, I can answer it in different ways. Um, load management is, is everything. So if your body is used to it, it can, can build up um, a resistance to whatever surface. If you're um, in retail and on your feet for 10 hours a day on a hard, flat surface, yep. if you go into a shoe without any cushioning and support, you're probably going to have really still feet. Mm -hmm. But... There are people that um, are so this way aligned that they slowly build up their ability to cope with that hard flat surface for that many hours a day. Mm -hmm. Our body's remarkably adaptable and will adapt to anything if you give it time to do that. So I think that's the principle of that specific adaptation to impose demand that when you, if you, if you slowly adapt your body, it can cope with anything, okay? Um, so, but that's very hard and very slow, long process. Mm. This is not for everyone. I'll say that. This is not for everyone. There are some people that just want their orthotics and they just want their big cushion shoes and that's okay. I'm not trying to change the world in that way, but that doesn't work for everyone either. And so this is a way that does work for a lot of people. And if you want to do it, it's just about time and patience, basically. Yeah. Uh, and it is about making systemic changes to your own life so that you become a more functional person. Yeah. Like yesterday, I walked three hours on hard, flat surfaces. Though that said, not any one step was the same, probably. Like there are hard, flat surfaces, but then you change in direction. Your body is constantly changing and adapting. And at the end of that three hours of walking, I had sore feet. And, it's, and I know why I had sore feet, because I walked for three hours. And if I'd walked for three hours in a pair of cushioned Nikes, I might've had sore feet as well, but I might've had sore feet in a different place. Um, because the pressure is still going through your foot in, in, in a way, you know. Um, so it's about accepting that th some things will make you sore and then you deal with it, change your behaviors, learn from it, move well, on. I suppose it's the whole health promotion concept, isn't it? I mean, I've been in the health promotion industry right back from when I studied in the late 90s or the, you know, mid-90s. And, um, you know, it's that whole idea of, 
of lifestyle changes that we know can give us a better life later, but yeah. not necessarily see things straight away. And so as a hu human nature, it tends to, see, tends to be what I see anyway, is that people make decisions about the now, which is awesome because we keep encouraging people to live in the now. So it's like this yeah. contra contra contradiction in a way. Um, about you know how will I feel now and right now I suppose if we relate to foot health it's cushioning it feels good yes it might cause yeah. me long-term damage but until I get the pain until yeah. the my hips and back and everything else are hurting um, yeah. I want to enjoy um, my time in what I do in the most most cushioning comfortable yeah. enjoyable way and I might be one of those inevitable, you know, those people who um, who don't get the problem. You know, I, yes, I'm yes, invincible. Yes. Everybody thinks they're invincible until it happens to them. So yes. it's very, very hard. Like I'm passionate about health promotion, but yes. it's so hard after, you know, for 20 years working in it, the changes that I've seen are so yes. small. And yeah, it's not there hasn't been any changes. Some areas are more than others, but... Yes. It's hard. It's a hard um, thing to to teach, and yet in a, the medical system is only struggling from it because they're creating problems that they're then dealing with, and then the government have a problem because obviously there's a whole lot of money that then needs to go into healthcare that otherwise yeah. may, may have been used with better options like you know prevention, yeah. promotion. I mean, it's that's a whole obviously another conversation, but it is but just frustrating. Yeah, or just on that, like if kids never went into a, a heel cushion shoe, then naturally they would get better at coping with their environment. Yeah. Um, and so it goes back to that. That's why I'm passionate about kids not going into those shoes. There's just no reason. Like when we have a baby and then they start walking, we put them in a wide, thin, flat, flexible shoe to help their foot develop while they're learning to walk. But since they go to kinder, we put them in a heel cushion supportive shoe. It makes no sense. They haven't feel, finished developing at four or five mm -hmm. years of age. And so if they never went into that shoe, then they'd never, they would just naturally not, they would naturally get used to their environment and cope with it. I'm not saying this is going to um, stop anyone getting any injuries because we still um, have nuances and things that cause injuries, you know. And so, um, and the other part about it is when we use a cushioned shoe, say on a hard flat surface, it cushions our foot, but that ground reaction force doesn't go away. It doesn't, doesn't magically dissipate in the shoe, it goes up to our knees and our hips and our lower back. Yeah. And so there's really good studies that show that when we hit the ground, there's ground reaction force. And in a cushioned shoe, it skips the foot and goes up into the joints further up. In a natural footwear or minimal shoe, the foot copes with it, has to cope with it. Our body's made, our, our foot is made to cope with it. Pronation, which is the um, bad word of, of feet, is a, is a slow is a, is a slow lowering of the foot onto the ground to adapt to the surface and to shock absorb. As we push off, our foot's meant to release that energy in a push off. So this is where our, our foot is meant to be this highly functional thing that absorbs shock and then releases it. When we put a cushion there, it's just along for the ride. It doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. when, when our foot absorbs shock and releases it, it ties in with our whole body being functional. It ties in with other things going on up the chain that make us very efficient in the way we walk. When we put a heel cushion shoe on, we lose that efficiency. We become a heavy heel striker. We become someone that walks heavily down the hallway, you know, rather than someone lighter on their feet. It's like a child running around the outside of a pool with bare foot. You see that style? You can, if you can imagine that type of running compared to seeing someone running in a heavy shoe, hitting their heels against the ground. And that's like a snapshot of what happens even in our walking. We become far less efficient because we're allowed to hit the ground so much harder because there's a big cushion on there. And yes, it feels good, but so does sitting in a couch all day. Should we sit in a couch all day? Um, it feels good, but it doesn't actually do us any good. It does us good if we need to have a rest, but a cushion on our, on our foot just does us zero good except for, like it does... <laughs> That doesn't make any sense either. It does us very little good unless you have so much foot issues that your foot needs protection in the short term. That's when I would use it. And if our kids never had cushioning, they would never need it. Mm. Oh, there's a lot, um, a lot of, a lot of good food for thought here, isn't there? Yeah. 
So yeah. I just want to, I know that I'm conscious of our time and it's, it appears that this is probably going to be quite a long conversation, but there is quite a lot I want to talk about while I've got you. And, yeah. um, and one of the other things is about pain. Now you said something earlier in the conversation that if you're not experiencing pain, then it's nothing to worry about. Um, or something, oh, yeah. something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah, right? Yeah. When I said it, I thought, oh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but I'm going to sort of, yeah. I want to I wanna challenge that a little bit and Good. I want to ask whether you think the pain is that only indicator that there's a problem or is there such a thing as maybe asymptomatic dysfunction, meaning there's no pain but there's still a problem and... I'm 100%, yeah. Pain is the last, you know, is pain the last level of the indication? Like what other indicators are there that there's a problem that could lead yeah. to our inability to do desired activities due to the last level, which is pain? Yeah, and when I said it, I thought that doesn't sound right. And I don't mean that. Mm. When a child comes to me though, who's 10 or 12 or any age and their parents are worried about their foot rolling in and they don't have pain, yes. if they maybe they're going to head towards having pain if they lead a, um, a movement starved life and stay in thick cushioned shoes and just keep grinding away at this um, less than ideal mechanics okay and and they are asymptomatically dysfunctional when they're wearing those shoes and when they're sitting there a lot so when i see someone like that i'll be like you are you you have the ability to be functional but these are the things you need to do to make sure that's going to happen, that you continue to develop in a way that's not going to be painful, okay? Um, so the flat foot or the rolled in foot is not one of those signs that they're dysfunctional. It's the, it's the environment that you're putting their body in that tells us that that means they must be dysfunctional. You know, knee osteoarthritis is a really um, a good example. And I thought of this when you were talking about... Um, technology like I think there's been a perfect storm in Western medicine that means that we've you know the onset of huge uh, huge rates of knee osteoarthritis for example we've also been able to start replacing knees or replacing hips with the onset of huge hip osteoarthritis maybe we weren't living so long so we didn't have these osteoarthritic conditions in the past but um, people are getting new hips when they're 50 and new knees when they're 45 these days you know so this is a huge um, changes to what was happening 150 years ago, but now we can replace it. And so that's been this perfect storm of Western medicine keeping up with what I think is dysfunctional lifestyles, where for, for years we sit in the office for eight, hour, eight to 10 hours a day, exercise for an hour intensely, and then go home and sit on the couch for another three hours, sleep, sleep for five hours instead of eight hours, eat poorly, highly inflammatory processed foods, all these things, like, so the majority of your life, even the one hour of intense exercise is, is um, having a detrimental effect on that knee. And, and footwear is part of it because it allows you to hit the ground really hard because it's cushioned. And so this is a dysfunctional human being, even though until they're 45, they don't even know it because that's when their knee starts to get sore. So, um, like you said, this is systematic, systemic change is required. And there are enlightened people that are changing their life. And, and it's who's to say, I'm not gonna get shocking ankle arthritis because I've been barefoot for the last four years. Like it's, it's a bit of a, like, wow, we'll just see what happens. But to me, it makes sense that our bodies, if we give, expose them to enough variability, it's what they're, they're made and designed to do, rather than that other, our other image of, life and i don't think i'm too far away from saying that less sleep poor diet highly station highly sedentary with with short um, bouts of high intensity exercise i think that would be covering a huge amount of the population at the moment and so this is not just about feet this is about whole holistic change for people yeah and i think it's like about making things instead of seeing it as really complicated and in your in this example trying to understand the mechanics and the biomechanics and the physiology and the alignment and all of that and then with nutrition trying to understand the chemical composition of foods and the you know the chemical reactions that happen in your body yeah. and all of those different things and although all those things are a piece of the puzzle in education 
for the general person, they don't need to know any of those things. All you really need to know is think simply. Think what your grandparents did. Think what was available then and try to just simplify your life. I mean, there's, there is... Uh, luckily a lot of movements that are taking off in simple living and a lot of them are starting with the house and decluttering and minimalization and all of that but that yeah. leads to a ripple effect on other areas of simplicity and you know when it comes to nutrition just eat something that's real food that grows on a tree and you know and um you know grows in the ground and you know, or as least packaged as possible, as least convenient, et cetera, et cetera. So without having to know a whole lot of information when it comes to lifestyle choices, it's about simplicity really, isn't it? So, yeah, and um, I'm with, uh, I'm with, I work with a group called The Foot Collective and we talk about the five pillars of health. So movement, um, variability, go to uh, sleep. So go to bed eight hours before you have to get up. That's like our, our, that's what, you know, that makes sense. Just go to bed eight hours before you get up, have to get up because then you give your body a chance to rest for eight hours. Um, food, eat food as in real food, mostly plants, not too much. You know, this, we can just so simply do these things. Mindfulness, spend some time every day doing your, within, with time to yourself, you know? Like for me, it's when I walk the dogs. So they're there, but not other people. So um, like for two hours a day, I'm, spending time with myself and then community be part of a community yeah. um you know so these pillars of these simple pillars of health that 200 years ago it would have been just what was available you yeah know? Like, i don't like, need to call it anything it just is no. yeah, <laughs> we, right. we've systemized it <laughs> right. yeah well we've had to um like we've had to go back to talking about it you know because it's we're so many of us are so far removed from it yeah Absolutely. Wow. So, so many things and there is so much I, I, do, I would love to talk more about this whole um, yeah. way our body adapts to things and, you know, the fact that the body doesn't really, I think, in a way care if we have pain and the, bo the body really, it doesn't give a damn if we're in pain. It just adapts to it, whatever instructions we give it. And, yeah. um, and, you know, that's a really, I think, a concept that if people really got to understand rather than you know yes the body the body's wise but not wise because it prevents things from happening for you it's wise as in it will do as it needs to do to adapt to the situation that you're giving it and yeah. so, you know to save energy for example when it needs to save energy so that it can think about that if it was in a situation where it really needed that energy that it could save it and if it was in a situation yeah. when we're sitting well why wouldn't it just slump if you don't have the muscles there that are going to hold it up because if the muscles aren't strong enough it means the body's just got to make so much energy it takes so much energy for it to actually sit properly or to stand up for a longer period of time. So it's just going to reserve your energy and be smart and go, well, you know, I'll just put you in a shit position because you haven't yeah. worked on your muscles properly. <laughs> Basically, it will take the easy way out to conserve energy to survive. Like we still have that in our system to... You know, and pain comes about basically because something's been overused and, and your body's saying, hey, ease back on this because that's hurting me, you know? So, so then you ease back you it, it adapts to the load it gets better again and so on you know if we take an anti-inflammatory it's basically short circuiting um our own system to heal ourselves and so that's what people do now they have pain so they take something to take the pain away rather than letting their body deal with it naturally and guess what the pain's probably going to come back yeah it is and that's interesting that you say that because i think that you um i actually wrote down when i was planning this episode I wrote down that word short circuit and saying, is there a place for short circuiting or circuit breaking? You know, because yeah. it is catch 22 in a lot of ways once we do have an injury and it's all great and well to change our lifestyles for the long-term benefit, but is there an opportunity or a benefit in short circuiting um, so that we can, or circuit breaking so that that reduces the catch 22, like take those anti-inflammatories um, until, so that you can do those exercises that are going to benefit you to increase the strength, but without those anti-inflammatories, then maybe you couldn't do those exercises. Yeah, so definitely, and I, that's what I'm dealing with every day because people don't come to see me generally because they've got um, 
because they've, they're doing well. They come to see me because they have pain. So I have to deal with that pain. But usually I would promote gentle movement and heat to help with pain, only to use an anti-inflammatory or, an, or ice when it's acutely sore. When, it, when, you, when you can't move, it's so sore, like it's stopping you function. You know, that's when those circuit breakers are worthwhile. Otherwise, let's encourage our body's natural healing by adding heat and gentle movement. Um, and that will stop delay that will stop the delay in healing it will actually encourage healing and so then you might be able to move on to the next step of your rehabilitation and you've um learned also how to deal with pain for the next time rather than putting those other stop gaps in place yeah and is, is when you say heat i mean generally people would think that if they've got an inflammatory problem that they would put ice yeah, so ice constricts blood vessels and takes away all the good things that the blood is bringing that would heal that problem. So even the guy that came up with rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, um, he, he's even said, look, that was, that's really only for that very acute injury. There's a new one, and you should look it up. It's peace and love. <laughs> oh. Peace and love. In, you, you would look up, you'd Google peace and love in injury um, prevention, and it's... Um, protecting the area it's elevating the area it's compression it's um movement it's heat it's um looking after yourself in the way that your body should naturally um look up look after itself rather than um what you still see the footballers and cricketers and all these people do they're all still whacking ice on their injuries um ice should be used when it's acutely sore that you want to take the pain away yeah otherwise it's delaying healing we the body's natural ability to heal outweighs anything else. And that's in, inflammation is its natural ability to heal. Mm. When yeah. someone's chronically inflamed, like they've had inflammation for a long period of time, that's, that's very rare. And then it's more of a pain syndrome. And we need to break down the pain message from their foot or their knee or their hip or whatever to their brain. And that, again, is with movement and different, um, different stimulus to help your body, your brain realise that that area is not injured anymore. It's just still giving that feedback system to pain. And so icing it is, again, a, a negative thing to do in that sense. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, in, really interesting. So maybe yeah. we can um, sort of wind up with just looking at some common foot problems and maybe just you sharing your um, ways or you know, discuss, you know, some of the causes and some of the lifestyle changes that people can do in their everyday life without feeling like it's a chore, dysfunctional exercise that can help some of these problems. Now, the three yeah. that I've written down as yes. what I thought were the most common, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is overpronation, but we've already talked about that, so we won't bother with that one, um, is arthritis and plantar fasciitis. So arthritis is inflammation of a joint. Yes. And so uh, that's often, often inflamed because of overuse. If the joint worked um, all the time properly or was being used regularly, it wouldn't get overused on the odd occasion, you know, like it might still get overused on the odd occasion, but it wouldn't be like stiff. Like if you're in a stiff shoe, your joints in your foot, and there are a lot of them, are just along for the ride. They're not actually moving. It's like when you put a cast around your arm, when you take that cast off, your arm is stiff, yep. okay? Your elbow might even be sore and arthritis is inflammation of the joint. And so you might have arthritis. So arthritis in the foot could be in the big toe joint. That's where it's really common. Um, nearly all shoes have something called toe spring, which is this um, space under the big toe that pushes the big toe up into this strange angle and holds it there. Um, if you have big toe joint pain or arthritis in the big toe joint, it's probably because it's so stiff. So generally speaking, mobilising, getting your feet moving is um, one of the best things you can do for arthritis because if we get the joint moving, it, your body starts sending goodness to it. So I might use a, a spiky ball or, or a stiff rubber ball to massage the sole of the foot a couple of times a day, really getting stuck into the joints or even using your own hand to get, get, get the joint moving so that it can have a, you know, a chance to heal and function better. So arthritis is a very general term, but that's what I would do in most situations. See how much movement is available and then try and encourage more movement, okay? Um, so that, and heat again, and gentle movement is the best thing for arthritis because it increases blood supply, which increases healing 
better movement. Um, arthritis, plantar fasciitis. So artis, it means inflammation and plantar fascia is the connective tissue on the sole of your foot. And so the artis, um, like it can't actually get inflamed. It can get a bit overused. So now they, 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 they call it plantar fasciopathy. I kind of have to say that because if I go on about plantar fasciitis, Every other podiatrist listening will be like, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So now we call it plantar fasciopathy, which means um, pathology of the plantar fascia. When we have it, it's often um, heel pain and there are so many other things going on in the heel. It's hardly ever the plantar fascia, or it still is, but a lot of the time it's a lack of strength in the other muscles in the foot. And so if you can imagine sitting on a hammock everything is just relaxed. And the plantar fascia is a bit like the hammock. When your foot is relaxed into the hammock, there's a lot of strain on it. It's pulling on it. If our foot is um, switched on and activated and being used functionally, the muscles in the foot are doing a lot of the work to stiffen our foot when it needs to be stiff, to soften our foot when it needs to be soft. And the, fa the fascia is um, acting as it is, working as it should work okay which is just kind of holding things together um part of this postural line up the back of our um bottom of our foot up the back of our legs all the way up our back to hold our posture in place so really plantar fasciitis is um i think more to do if you actually have plantar fascia fasciitis i think it's more to do with the rest of your foot not functioning so well Okay, so we need to get that happening. For pain, again, in the short term, using a, a ball, like nearly everyone I see goes away rubbing their foot on, the, on, the, on a ball because it helps with pain. But I would never push into the sore spot. Like if you're sore in your heel, then probably the worst thing you can do is to drive something hard into it because that's just gonna aggravate it more. It's like picking a scab, you know, it's not gonna heal. So we wanna push the ball into all the other sore spots. Um, we might use heat, movement, and then um, I'm, a, if you haven't worked it out yet, I think most shoes, um, modern shoes, put a lot of strain on the plantar fascia that's not necessary. And so um, going into a shoe gently and easing yourself in, there's a, a whole transitional phase to get out of the thing that causes the strain and to make your feet stronger is what helps plantar fascia issues in the long run. In the short term, an orthotic will help because it unloads the area. But um, you should always have an exit plan with an orthotic. It's not a long-term issue. And I've heard of also people putting those boots on their feet overnight and stuff for that. Well, that's to stretch the plantar fascia, to stretch everything out. But really, um, if you were just walking in a flat shoe without a heel, you wouldn't need to stretch your foot out. It would be stretched with every step. It would be doing its normal thing. Yeah, that's called a night splint. They don't really work that well. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, yeah. I think you, you know, I think you've given us so much to think about and yeah. um and really I think encourage. I mean, I do wear barefoot in the house all the time and yeah. most of the time and um and around the place as well. But yeah, there's a lot to, a lot of probably options where I could be wearing more bare feet more. And obviously there's gonna be times like with every single um choice lifestyle choice we make that doesn't necessarily benefit your health but benefits your happiness in other ways like if i go out and i want to look a certain way and i know very well that that might not be good for my foot but it makes me feel good in what i'm wearing i'm going to do it and it's the same with you know maybe eating that 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 chocolate is not necessarily a good decision but it benefits my pleasure and so i think that if we can reduce if we're going to get stressed about um doing things in a way that's always good for us then the stress that that's the, the stress is actually causing the bigger problem so agree, yeah. find that balance between you know doing things that that aren't going to feel overwhelmingly stressful and finding ways like you said of just doing simple things that can actually support our foot health that don't feel overwhelming and the first step for people, if they want to make that first step, is what you do. It's being barefoot around home and just noticing it. And if they're not used to it, five minutes of barefoot around home and then the next day, 10 minutes and slowly build that up. And because every step then is working your foot the way it's naturally meant to. And that's a great place to start um, by being barefoot around home and rolling a, a, 
a hard ball into the sole of your foot, getting your foot used to being moved again. That, that's where I'd recommend most people start if they want to start down looking after their feet in a natural way. Yeah, brilliant. That's so good. Oh, my God, we could really talk about this for another hour. There's so many <laughs> think, think talking about a foot health. I'm going to do an episode on feet and foot health and, you know, podiatry that I'll probably be a half hour episode and we've, you know, gone way over the hour. So, <laughs> so it seems that there's a lot to talk about. Um, and I think it's a lot of a bigger conversation on generally functional health all round, yeah. natural and functional health. But um, is there anything where I haven't covered that you'd love to um, add to the conversation? Um, it's not for everyone. It takes motivated people that are that want to do this type of thing. And I'm not trying to change all of podiatry. I just want people that are podiatrists that are, feel this way to have a place to work and have a place um, where you can, you know, you can put up a shingle saying you're a natural podiatrist and people will understand that they're coming for natural foot function rather than um, traditional podiatry. And how, and you mentioned before as well, um, I think we mentioned it off air, that you are looking to get a collective of podiatrists that might be interested in learning more about this way of treating and um, advancing their skills in this area. So yeah. um, is that something that's going to be on board soon? If people are interested, is there a way, like if a podiatrist happens to listen to this, is there a way that they can express their interest? Do you have an expression of interest mailing list or anything like that? So um, the, on Instagram, there's a, something called at natural podiatry and that will have all the updates and we're just still working on how it's going to work. Uh, but over the next month or two, things will be sort of um, starting to build and anyone can contact me at my practice if they're interested. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, Andy. It's been such a pleasure talking to you and so inspirational and it's definitely given me some motivation to, you know, do things probably in a more natural way. Yeah. Um, for those listening, what's your biggest insight or takeaway from today's conversation? I'd love to know if you could drop a comment under this episode or on any social media that might this episode might be shared on and then we can have a further conversation about it. If you'd like to know more about Andy and where, if you were interested in seeing him as a podiatrist professionally or just find out and follow him more, um, he gives a lot of information and tips and tools on his social media sites. How can they do that? Um, so there's Andy Bryant underscore podiatrist on um, Instagram. My website is Melbourne Natural Podiatry or Mount Waverley Podiatry. And that is slowly having my, my input from social media put onto that as well. They're the two main ways. And also um, looking up the Food Collective on Instagram or on Facebook or on their website has great, um, basically they encapsulate what I'm on about, the Food Collective. Fantastic. And I'll put all of those details on the show notes as well. So if you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your friends and consider subscribing to the Wealthy Living Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, any ways that you listen to a podcast. To find out more about my services, you can visit my website at wealthyliving.com.au or connect with me on any of my social media channels. Until next time, remember, connection is medicine.